Welcome into the Warchant.com report. I'm Jeff Cameron of ESPN Radio. These two guys work for Warchant. That's Corey. That's Ira. Thanks for tuning in. Florida State, Northern Illinois, 3:30 ESPNU. And uh, Northern Illinois comes into this game with a fine defense, but a one and two record. Florida State not doing much of anything well at one and two. All right, Willie Taggart after the blowout loss to Syracuse, sensing that fans are feeling a little concerned about the direction of the program, had a prepared statement this week, and this is what it sounded like. Our fans have every right to have high expectation of our program. And I can assure you that no one has higher expectation than I do. Uh, we have a proud history, of t history and tradition of football at FSU. And it, is in our, and it is on our shoulders to carry on the torch. And our fans, students, alumni, former players deserve a team that plays better than what we have so far this season. Our program has some tremendous young men who are determined to get it fixed and who are committed to, committed to turning this around in a group of coaches who are looking at everything, including ourselves. All right, Ira, do you agree? Now we hear from Willie Taggart there with uh, publicly coming out, obviously, and, and, and handling this situation uh, the way that he has and addressing the fans and addressing the team and addressing the media with uh, a vote of confidence and assurance that they'll get this worked out. Yeah, I think it was the right tone. I think some people take exception to the idea that he had to read a prepared statement uh, it didn't seem like it was the, that's something you usually do after a big, some big controversy or legal matter or something yeah. like that. It seemed a little odd from that standpoint, but the message I think was the right message, especially after the game. I think after the game, it seemed like Willie kind of came out, uh, you know, he kind of threw the offensive line under the bus, he singled out some different groups. I think it was smart for him to come out and say, Look, we're going to figure this out. I have confidence and try to kind of settle the fans a little bit. I don't think it worked, but I think it was the right idea to try it. Well, when you get beat like that, it's awfully tough to convince fans of anything different until the on-field product is better. Is it, though, to the extreme at this point, the criticism that Willie Taggart is facing from the fans, from the media? I've seen nationally writers come out and rip him. Uh, this is a guy who did everything right in the offseason, and no kids got in trouble, highest GPA, all that stuff, but then you see the hip hypocrisy of that. It's about winning games. It's always yeah. about winning games. So that's not happening, but there, there are people actually talking about Willie Taggart being fired, which, oh, by the way, will not happen after this year, whether they win another game or not. Is it unfair? The criticism he's receiving? The extent of the criticism, the degree to which he's being criticized. Well, if you're talking about three games. that it's over, he can't, he can't win, and that uh, you know this was a terrible hire and he needs to be fired, yeah, that's unfair. But criticism certainly is warranted because that, as we've talked about, my friend Jeff Cameron, mm -hmm. is a bit of an abomination. <laughs> We, I looked it up. Ugly, yeah. Florida State's averaging five points a game in ACC games this year. I was going to have to document that. Back, oh, okay. So I'm glad you were so able to get that. Because I don't know if you remember, they had a field goal in they the first game. They did have the one field goal, yeah. And then they had a seven-point showing against Syracuse. So if you add that up, that's ten. You divide by two, that's five points a game. My Florida State math agrees. Florida State's basketball team had nine players average more than that in basketball games That's this not year. good. That's not a great stat. Christ Kumaji. Christ. Chris, Christ, whatever you want to I was going to say, I don't think most people call him Christ. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Chris, yeah. He averaged more points a game than this, if mm. you can believe it. So, no, the, the criticism is certainly fair for what it looks like. It doesn't mean it's a referendum on his tenure here. He's going to be here three years, two or three years, even if it keeps looking like this. So, after three games, is too early to make a judgment on what he's going to be as the Florida State head coach. But it's certainly not too early to say, man, this has to change because this is disgusting. And it is. What's the most surprising element of what you've seen during this lousy showing? I think the most surprising thing to me is just the fact that the, the offensive approach hasn't really changed in these first three games. The fact that they've kept doing the same thing. And the fact that he clearly uh, thought that this was going to work. Uh, it would be one thing if... Uh, he came into the season and, and, and totally dramatically changed what he was trying to do to try to adjust to the personnel. But he had the entire spring and the entire offseason and all of preseason camp to figure out if this is what would work. And he believed it was going to work. And for it to look that bad, to me, that's surprising. And again, I think when you talk about what's disconcerting, it's the fact that they've made few adjustments and also that he must have seen something in practice to think this is going to work. And why is it not translating at all on Saturdays? How much of this is on Willie Taggart and his new staff, and how much of this is a residual effect of what Jimbo Fisher and his staff, Rick Trickett and the like, didn't do? Yeah, I mean, I think the brunt of it goes to Jimbo and Rick Trickett. I mean, how much could you do with this offensive line? Not a whole lot. And I think it's people point to the offensive line, and that is a huge issue, and that's the reason they have 10 points in two games, the biggest reason. But it's a whole, it's a whole attitude around a program. It's the kind of kids that are in this program right now that – that just were coached a certain way, whether it's entitlement, 
all of it, going back to not, the, the GPAs, like they, there was just, there was no accountability. And they're used to losing. These guys have never really won anything of note. It's so, a dangerous thing to get used to losing. Yeah, and they just, are. It happens. You're and, right. And they, there's been too many times where the players on this roster have just kind of given up in a game. And you saw that a bit on, on Saturday against Syracuse. It's still in their DNA. That's not Willie Taggart's fault. But he does have to figure out a way to get it out of their DNA, to, to make them a whole different roster and a whole different culture. And apparently it takes more than one offseason because it's a, looks a lot like, even though the defense is better, it looks a lot like the same defense we saw last year as far as the physicality. They, the, when they realized the game was over, they stopped pursuing the ball real well. And I get it, and it was hot. And, it was and they were out degrees. there an awful lot because yeah. this offensive line can't move the football. But so. do they have pride? Do they have the pride that I think is so. In the red zone, they did. I think they, they continued to buck up. At some point, you lay down from sheer exhaustion. I mean, the offense doesn't move the ball. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not as reticent. I mean, I am reticent to say that they're giving up. They were, they were on the field for 88 plays, but to Corey's point, the dam broke well before 88 plays. The dam broke probably yeah, about in the 55. 55 yeah. like I would also note if I saw that offense. I hear you. But so the, 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 question, the answer is, yeah, most of it I think is on Jimbo. But Willie hasn't done anything to correct. You know, he hasn't given you any hope that, that he is going to turn it around. That doesn't mean he won't. But through three games, you could understand why fans would be like, man, well, show us something. Do something. Do something. <laughs> Hashtag it. Imagine that. That's a mantra. It should be. It should Somebody should hashtag. adopt that and yeah. do it soon. Uh, soon we'll come back and talk of the Warchant.com report about this offensive line and the train wreck that we find out there every Saturday and again this Saturday. That'll be fun. It's football season in Tallahassee, and the only place to go for FSU apparel and merchandise is Garnet and Gold, locally owned and operated by Seminoles for Seminoles for nearly 40 years. Garnet and Gold has the best selection of FSU merchandise in town, but what we really sell is tradition and passion to serve you, the true Seminole fans, at all three of our locations, West Pensacola Street, Killarne, and our flagship store across from Regal Cinema, online at garnetandgold.com. Shop local and go Knowles. Welcome back to the Warchant.com report. Uh, Obviously, at this point, if you've watched these games, Florida State hasn't played well, and the culprit for that, for the most part, has been the offensive line. There are other woes that we could get into, but the the glaringly obvious problem is the offensive line at this point. And so when you're averaging less than 100 yards a game on the ground with this backfield, which is simply loaded with talent, uh, obviously against FBS foes, they're not exactly lighting up in total yardage either. Only scoring five points a game uh, on average is, is... well, hurt your feelings about dead ass last in the uh, FBS, I believe. So, uh, why was Willie Taggart so optimistic this off season? Uh, every chance he had an opportunity to talk, he thought that that line could be adequate. Now he doesn't have all the guys that he thought he was going to have, but he thought they'd be better than this. Yeah, he did, and he would say the phrasing he would say sometimes during the off season was, "They're going to be better than you think," mm. which I guess it depends on what you thought uh, coming into the uh, situation. Look, we have to we have to face some realities. One is that this is not even the same offensive line they thought they were going to have, which would have been average at best anyhow. It was not going to be a great situation anyway. But when you lose Landon Dickerson in the first game, and you look at the they did move the ball at times against Virginia Tech. You take Landon Dickerson out, he gets hurt. He's going to be out for at least a month, maybe more. Uh, you also get some other guys banged up. Cole Minshew's been banged up. Corey Martinez, who was expected to be a top backup at several positions and really give you the flexibility to maybe move Alec Eberle to another position because Corey could play center. He gives up football during camp. I mean, it's just been one thing after another. During the offseason, Josh Ball got kicked out of school. It's been one thing after another. This was not going to be a good offensive line anyway, but it's been a perfect storm of things going against them. And they're having to play some guys, Willie also said on Monday, accurately, they're having to play some guys who weren't expecting to play. I mean, Arthur Williams was on the defensive line until the first day of preseason camp, and now he's playing. He's, and starting. He's a key player on this <laughs> offensive line. So yeah. it's been a, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a mystery to why this is going poorly. What can you do to mitigate those problems? Because, you know, I don't care the scheme. I don't care what system you want to run, whether it's Jimbo's pro-style offense, whether it's spread, tempo, whether it's read off. Anything you want to run, you can't run successfully if your offensive line is a sieve. So what can they do? I mean, start punting earlier in the possession, <laughs> maybe second or third down. You don't always have to punt on fourth down. They know it's coming. That's true. So maybe punt Shock on. everybody with a first down punt. <laughs> first down punt, you know. We're going to cash you get your quarterback hurt. Yeah, yeah. Um, man, I, I think we've talked about it a little bit earlier in the week about, you know, you've, you've got to roll. You've got to have a quarterback that's mobile, that's willing to scramble. If you have a quarterback that can scramble, roll out to his right, and actually make plays with his legs, well, that will slow down a rush in itself if they think that's a real weapon where a quarterback will run the ball. But also, more than that, 
move the pocket. You know, you can do some max protection stuff too. That's allowed. You can also move the pocket. What was so frustrating, I think, for Florida State fans on Saturday is they didn't look like they made any adjustments at all. They're like, you know what? I know that you keep see, you keep hitting our quarterback every time we snap it to him with five trying to block your four, but we're going to keep doing it. We're not going to change anything and just meet him at, meet him at the back of his drop because he's going to be standing there and you're going to get uh, you're both going to get half a sack to the defensive ends. It was every other play, and that I think was what's so frustrating. So you have to move your quarterback out, and if he's not willing to run, find somebody that will. I was going to say especially because you have a quarterback that doesn't seem to have great pocket awareness. Yeah. It would be one thing if DeAndre was like the Sanford quarterback, a guy like that who, who can feel the pressure. DeAndre doesn't seem to feel the pressure, know how to move around in the pocket. So you have to get him, you have to make him get out of the pocket, I think, with those rollouts. Yeah, you got to move the pocket. You get DeAndre some run pass options outside of the pocket where he could utilize his ability to run the ball, although that's been diminished both by the injury and now I think a lack of willingness to run because of a loss of confidence. And as many times as he's been hit, it's awfully hard to blame him for losing some confidence and not wanting to get hit there. Uh, I I think obviously you got to avoid negative plays and penalties. This is a group right now that doesn't help itself either. They're behind the chains incessantly. And that's how guys tee off on your quarterback. When it's second and long, third and long, these are all obvious pass downs. They can't block it up when it's long, uh, slow developing plays at the mesh right. point, those kinds of things. you got to do quick hitters and run your quarterback uh, and find a way to stay out of negative plays. I know that sounds easier. It's easier said than done, and it sounds obvious. But I'm, I'm saying literally, if I see some second eights and thirds and fours, I'll take that. Florida State is in third and long every time they're trying to convert. Very seldom do you see third and two. Third and one. It's always third and 12, third and 14, that's third you, and eight. That's how you get a quarterback killed. And that's how you end up one for 14 on third down. That's right. And as of last week going into the game, I think they were the worst in the country on third down. Now they're definitely. Well, I think they're maybe 126 okay. or 130, I think. Yeah, Again, guys. Pretty close. A few other teams had yeah. some worse ones. A little hyperbole on my part. A little so, bit. Yeah, no, 130, 126. 130. 126. Yeah. Again, guys, we, we might want to revisit the punting on third down. If you're not going to get it anyway. But they don't have a good punter. No, Francois punts. Oh, he surprises okay, a little them. quick kick. A little quick kick. Yeah. You, nobody little drop back kick deep. action. You're, switching the, you're flipping the field, folks. Saturday's game against Northern Illinois may be their last best chance to win a football game. That's disheartening. Nobody wants to hear that, but it's a big, big game if you're looking to get two wins. <laughs> <laughs> How important is it? on Saturday for Florida State, A, to win the game, uh, and for the rest of the season uh, to show some signs of life, obviously. Yeah, obviously, it's an important game to win. If you can win this game, any win they can get is a huge win. Two and two, baby. This is maybe the first team we've ever covered where the coaches say the next game is the biggest game. Like, this really is the biggest game because it's a game that they can win and you would say should win. They're favored by double digits, even though they've started as poorly as they have. Uh, You know, I think the other – but the biggest thing is the big picture – and Corey wrote this about, about this on, on the site, warchant.com. You can read it. You just want to see progress from week to week. You want to see different areas showing development. You want to know that the coaches are coaching these guys, that there's, there are adjustments being made, players are making individual development, and also that the younger players are getting some opportunities. I think that's how you have to watch this team going forward. If they win this game, great. They're still probably not going to be a bowl team. They're still probably not going to be a seven or eight win team. But you just want to see development. I think that starts this week. You want to see some new things on offense and some progress. Yeah, you're seriously limited uh, about what you can do with an offensive line that looks like this, but kids need to be put in a position to succeed, and it's a coach's job to coach around your weaknesses, coach towards your strengths. We haven't been able to identify a strength yet, so I'd like to see something that helps us say, okay, well, that's what they are. That's what this team's identity is. It's not much, but it's going to have to suffice until next year. And, oh, by the way, on that point, you alluded to it earlier, so I'll bring it up here. When would you pull DeAndre Francois? To be sure, this is not all his fault, but he hasn't helped. He doesn't seem to understand this offense and how to run it real well. Uh, And now he's seeing ghosts, understandably. When would you make a change to James Blackman, or would you? Maybe first or second incomplete pass. (laughs) Get him out of there. I would say, uh, I think, honestly, if this offense doesn't get appreciably better in the next three or four weeks, and it's, I think at that point you could realize, okay, my man doesn't run this well. He's just not cut for this offense, which makes sense. He wasn't recruited for this offense. Sure. And that doesn't mean that James Blackman would do any better. But could he do worse? That's what you'd have to ask yourself. And you're also playing for 2019. If you know DeAndre Francois, if you've got six or seven game films to say he can't get this done, he can't be the, the athlete we need him to be with the legs as far as choosing to run, he can't make the read well, and he's not quick, and he's also – He's kind of shattered mentally. All that could happen in the next month. If that happens, man, you got to start playing to 2019. And maybe somehow the guy that you think is not as good as Francois 
when the lights are on, is a better player in this system, makes the quicker reads. He's certainly taller. He can see over the line. Maybe he gives you something, but try it because you're playing for 19 at this point, right? And if Francois is not going to be your starter in 2019, if you know that he just struggles with it, try something else. Boy, it's, I know. It's, it's depressing, folks. But would it matter? What can we do here? But you got I mean, the reality is the reality. And, and one thing to say, I think we all three agree, those kids love James Blackman. I don't know if they love DeAndre Francois. I know that they love James Blackman. They all seem to light up when they talk about him. So they're going to play hard for him. Uh, I'm, again, I'm not trying to intimate that they're not playing hard for DeAndre Francois. I mean, they're just not any good up front. But, you know, DeAndre had a reaction in this game that we all thought was maybe understandable when he turned away from help from Abdubello out of frustration. But as a leader and a quarterback, it's really not something you can do. And so you may empathize, but those are the kinds of things that leads one to believe that perhaps they don't have the greatest relationship. Fans' reaction is fairly obvious. We'll talk about that and make our picks and keys to the game when we come back on the Warchant.com report. Hey, this is John in Greenville, South Carolina. This is Eric from uh, New Haven, Connecticut. My name's Jared. I'm from Mobile, Alabama. Nephew from Oklahoma. This is Ryan Yate from Marshall, Georgia. This is Carrera from Colorado, Texas. This is Josh from St. Louis, Missouri. This is Roger from North Carolina. Wake up, Corey. Wake up, Aslan. It's Gibby. Still coming to you guys from East Village in Manhattan, New York City. This is Kevin. I'm up here in Radford, Virginia. It's Chris from beautiful, sunny Phoenix. Sam Ryan, all the way from Little Rock, Arkansas. Hey, this is Josh from South Dakota. Just wanted to call and say love the show. First of all, I want to start off by saying I love you guys' show. I uh, really appreciate the show. Great show, guys. Uh, Really enjoy it. I love uh, the podcast. Uh, big fan of the show. Keep up the good work, guys. Keep up the good work. Love the show. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up, Warchant. Welcome back. Warchant.com report. So obviously fans are very angry, and they have a right to be very angry. I would caution against calls for firing people through three games, but your frustration and anger is understandable. I'm wondering how many people you think show up to this game on Saturday? It's actually supposed to be a pretty good crowd. We'll see how many people actually show up, but they've sold a lot of tickets, more tickets than you would expect. I think they did some good marketing things. Uh, I think earlier Gave this away week, free tickets? Well, some marketing things, some cheaper reduced, some group sales. Yeah, uh, perhaps. But I think that um, I think earlier this week there was less, less than 5,000 seats available. So, look, I think the in-town people will come. I think some of the out-of-the-town people will not come. Although there might be some people who just want to see, just want to see if anything changes. Because, again... You want to know if this guy, Willie Taggart, and this coaching staff are going to be the key, are going to be part of the turnaround, or if this thing has no chance of survival. So I think mm. uh, people are going to watch this. I think people are going to still be watching to see kind of what develops. I don't know if everybody's just given up hope completely. I would hope not. I'll say this again. There was enough earned goodwill from the offseason. There's no doubt Willie Taggart cares greatly about this program in the same way that fans and alumni do. There's no doubt that Willie Taggart cares greatly about these kids in a way that at times we could wonder about the previous staff given that they weren't made to go to class, they weren't made to change their behavior when it was negative for the other players. Um, I, I think at some point, uh, obviously it turns to winning games, there's no doubt, but what happened this offseason was earned. All that goodwill, no. all that positive PR was earned for a right reason. Uh, reasons, I would say. Give the guy time. I don't think you could be calling for Willie Taggart's head in year one, even if they go 1-11. and 11. Now, I know a lot of people will vehemently disagree with that. And I will be critical if they go 1-11, and 11, just as we're critical right now. But year one, they're not firing Willie Taggart. They would owe him $21 million that they don't have. They're not firing him. But also, I think... You are curious to see, for those that are more level-headed, how much time they give him before even those that are in his corner who have bought into the goodwill that was, as we noted, earned. Uh, how, when do they start to turn? Because then you're in trouble because then you got to get those people back. And it's hard to get people back once they're off, especially if they were all in to begin with. But wouldn't you think at this point that the people that have turned on him would have already turned on him? Well, like, I think a lot what, of those people had turned on him before he ever coached it down here. But what could, you, what could happen over the next nine weeks that is any worse than what we've seen already? Like, I know you say they could go 1-11. and 11. Well, I'm expecting 3-9. and nine. I mean, I'm not expecting much better than that. I don't know how anybody watching this show could expect much better than that. So there's really not anything... If, you, if you're still in his corner now after that debacle in Syracuse, which I think we all are, like, hey, yeah. give him time, I don't know what could change over the next nine weeks where you're like, yeah, this guy can't get it done. We need to get rid of him. So, uh, if, 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 if there are no changes, if nothing... Yeah, but I think we all think there will be, Well, right? I mean, I think we yeah. will be, but I think that would be the concern, is if 
you know, if you just were stubborn and you had no other options. Right. I think that's the way fans felt after that game, especially the fans that expressed their feelings on our message boards, was, does, is there not a plan B? Is there not an alternative? Is there not something else you could be doing? And that's the, their concern right now. So I think just seeing something different will give people a sense that, okay, there are other alternatives. It's not, he doesn't only know one way to coach. Both these teams play pretty good defense. I know Northern Illinois does, and when Florida State's defense isn't on the field incessantly, they play pretty good defense, too. We may see a very low-scoring game. Get into some of the keys to the game here. Uh, when you got two offenses that are struggling, that's putting it mildly, what would you say is a key to the game this Saturday? <laughs> I mean, don't turn it over in your own end. Don't give up the easy. That, yeah, you know, every possession ends with a kick. <laughs> Florida State did a really good job of that on yeah. Saturday for the most part. Um, yeah, I mean, don't make the crazy crippling mistakes. I mean, you know, theoretically, Florida State should beat Northern Illinois by three touchdowns. I mean, going into the season, I thought we, I, I think we thought that was uh, yeah, I almost think, understood. Yeah. Now that's not the case. So don't give them, make them at least go earn their points because they're going to make you earn your points. So that's been that's proven very yes, difficult. And yeah, you yeah, haven't yeah. done a good job of earning anything on offense. So I, I think that's the key, like you said, just. Limit turnovers and make them go drive the field if they're going to. And don't give up 60-yard plays on the first play. That's a good idea, too. Sanford has, uh, the Sanford game lowered our sights uh, at what we think is possible in any game, uh, including one against Northern Illinois. What, are you, what do you think is the key to this game? Well, I think, you know, you listen to Willie Taggart speak on Monday and also to Walt Bell on Tuesday. They both, the first things really they talked about was establishing the running game. So that seems to be, and look, that the reality is they have to. Even if it's not getting any progress, even if it's two yards to carry, they have to show some commitment to it because, like you said earlier, Syracuse was just pinning their ears back. They were charging straight up field, and those, defense, those offensive linemen had no chance. There has to be a threat of a running game. There has to be a threat that DeAndre might run the ball, and I think that's what you're going to see in this game. Willie, I think when you asked earlier the most surprising thing, I think the fact that he has not been committed to the running game. If you look at the last – four or five years when he's been coaching at Oregon or USF, they have pounded the ball and pounded the ball and pounded the ball. Even when they weren't winning, they've been committed to the run. They've kind of banded it so far here. So I think you're going to see a commitment to the running game. And I think that will be big. I don't know, again, Cam Akers hasn't looked great. Jock West Patrick has looked good at times. I don't know if that's going to be the answer to a lot of success, but I think it's a positive step. All right, let's get to our picks. Uh, last week was a tough one for me. I don't think I was any good last week. I don't remember well. my record. I was good the first week, not good this past week. Here we go. Way in, boys. Boston College taking on 0-3 Purdue. That's the best 0-3 team in the country. Uh, BC's given 6.5. I like BC. I have all year. I thought they'd have a great season. Um, but that's mm, that's rich. I don't know. I'm wavering a little bit. I'll take BC. I'll take the fighting Adazios. It's interesting about Purdue because everybody, a lot of people wanted Brom to be the coach of Florida State, and he's 0-3 right now. But he had so. a great season last year. He did. He did. did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to take Boston College as well. You got me on, the, you got me on board, Jeff. Adazio, you buddy. Board. They're physical. They run the ball. They got a good quarterback. Yeah, quarterback's good, man. Yeah. Quarterback can make some plays, so I'll take BC. Clemson's given 16.5 to Georgia Tech. I know how much you like Paul Johnson. Do not like Paul Johnson, but I like those points. I think Georgia Tech, just when you think they're dead, oh, just when you think gracious. they're out. Clemson has not been that great so far. They've been a little sloppy. I'm going to take the points with the Yellow Jackets. Clemson goes through the motions. I did have Georgia Southern plus 33.5 last week, so that helped. Oh, there you uh, go. What are you going to do with the Yellow Jackets here? I'm going to take Georgia Tech, too. I think Clemson's got four guys that's gonna, that are going to be drafted in 10 weeks. You think they're, they're going to like that offense? They're not going to be knees. excited about I guys like that diving inside. at their knees. That's what you're doing there. Might 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 hobble off a couple times to to save their knees and save their paychecks in a in a few months. I think Georgia Tech sucks. I'll take Clemson in a landslide. <laughs> all right, Notre Dame minus seven and a half against Wake Forest. Give me Wake all day long. I like I like Wake. And hey, one more reason to kind of give Willie a little bit of time. If you think back to Wake's offense, the first year that coaching oh, staff got there. Oh, my goodness gracious. They I couldn't block anybody. Corey and I were sitting there in some games, and Corey would be like, what is he trying to do with this, that offensive line? It looked like a complete train wreck. They turn around. I watched them play against Only Boston four College. years later. But, but, but <laughs> hang on there. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, also yeah. Wake Forest. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, I got but, you. no, I mean, man, they, they, I watched them against Boston College. The overwhelming thing, thought during that game was, man, Florida State probably can't beat either of these teams. But – the Demon Deacons look pretty good, man. I'm going to take them as well. I'll uh, take this, especially with seven and a half. Yeah, seven and a half. Give me the hook I'm all taking day. the Deeks. Yeah, got to take the Deeks. Here's here's a stat, and I'm 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 going to be off by a couple points on a few of these games. But Notre Dame's last five games, the final scores are 24 to 17, 21 to 17, 22 to 17, 24 to 17. Literally every one of their games, the last five wins. Look for Notre my Dame. man uh, Dorch. Is that his name? The the yeah. the gig the. 
Scrappy, small, small scrappy dude, guy. Wade Forrest, a good scrappy wide receiver. Guy. Yeah, I like him. All right, Florida's given four. Guy, yeah. Florida's given four and a half to Tennessee. I'm not prepared to take the Gators on the road in an SEC game and give points ever against any SEC team. So I'll take Tennessee plus four and a half. Two bad football teams, but I'm going to take the. Uh, yeah, yeah, get take the, the volunteers. Balls. Yeah. A little stat for you. A little stat bomb for you. Right. Florida has lost its last seven games against the Power Five opponents. Tennessee has lost its last nine games against Power 5 opponents. So they're out there doing some things. So who, boy. But I'll take Tennessee just because it's two bad football teams, and they're at home, and they're getting points. Jeremy Pruitt's got something for Florida. We'll I don't see. think Florida, Florida's only scored like one touchdown maybe on him in his life. He, he knows how to, he knows how to defend these guys. TCU's given three at Texas. I'm not a big Tom Herman guy, but I'm going to go with Texas in the three. I like Corey says that. Jeremy Pruitt knows how to stop that Florida offense. Other people don't. Other people struggle. But, but Jeremy, <laughs> Jeremy Pruitt's, Pruitt's got, got, he's got the, yeah. I'm going to go uh, TCU minus three. Uh, going against her. Yeah. Pruitt's like uh, Felipe Franks' is kryptonite. Like, <laughs> he's great against everyone else, but somehow he can't manage. TCU giving three. Uh, I'm going to say, uh, yeah, man, I like TCU. I'll take Texas. I'm going to go ahead and win that game, guys. Uh, Texas A&M is at Alabama, where Alabama is giving a robust 26 and a half points. Now, we saw what they did to Ole Miss. They gave up the opening score of the game and then said, here we go, we're going to hang 60-plus on you, get you some at your stadium. I'll take Alabama, drop 26 and a half, and cruise to a cover. It's a big number, man. Oh, it's Texas a number. Not a You've heard all this good talk out of College Station. Is that game at the same time as the Florida State game? Yeah, you'll have to tell me what happens in the Florida State game. Well, will he be offended if none of us are watching? <laughs> For all watching Alabama, Texas a uh, We can watch the FSU on the replay. Yeah. I'm going to take the points. I'm going to go with Jimbo. My first opportunity to make a pick well, involving been a Jimbo, big Jimbo Fisher. Guy, you so know where my loyalty is yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm taking uh, the Aggies and the points. Oh, the old master. Going to keep it close. Yeah. Uh, me too. I'm taking A&M and the points. I think Boy, Jimbo, I, I just steal like money Jimbo from you guys. I might just steal a win there, to oh, be honest with you. You might get – I mean, they almost beat Clemson, right? So you could be Alabama on the road. That quarterback. I'll give you not fifty to good. one odds, straight up. I'll take Alabama if you win for a dollar for a hundred bucks. Oh, get out of here! Let's no, do I'm it. Not wasting a hundred bucks. Come on, man. <laughs> fifty to one. Bucks. I'm doing you right. Yeah. Uh, finally, and this is this is a toughie. Northern Illinois <laughs> is getting ten. Uh, Florida State is giving ten points to Northern Illinois. I'm gonna go with Northern Illinois here. Yeah. So will I. I'll take the points. Okay. Yeah. There's. No We're problem. all taking Northern Illinois. <laughs> Great job, Aslan. For Corey and Ira, I'm Jeff. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Watching in this case. Sorry, I usually do radio. Be well, and we'll talk to you after this game. Hopefully we'll have better news.